Okay, so I'm going to talk in general about uh, sort of breaking up and, you know, basically not wanting another person to go into pain around a breakup. Uh, also, uh, you know, the term that was often used by Dr. Hawkins, you know, making decisions based in the interest of the highest good of all concerned, you know, the, the highest good for everyone, you know. So those are, those are great questions. You know, and I often get to, because I go to, I go to 12-step addiction meetings, lots of them, and so things like codependency and love addiction uh, and people who are very, very sick and getting attached to people who are not necessarily saying sick, but may have a lot of drama going on in their life, maybe it's a politer way of talking about it. Um, I'm going to say a few things, uh, just as generalities, because... You know, it's very difficult sometimes when you're in a painful, not in a painful relationship, in a relation, intense relationship, uh, and what do you do if you're in an intense relationship? So one of the things is, I want to talk a little bit about 12, the wisdom of 12-step groups. I'm not making a specific recommendation in any particular situation, but often we say in 12-step groups um, that um, to... Um, to surrender the person to God. You know, you don't have to be always like their caretaker and their savior. You know, there's this idea that, oh, you know, and here's the thing with levels of consciousness. Like if I'm not, I'm not in a romantic relationship uh, as such at the moment, but uh, if I was in a romantic relationship and let's say I cared for the other person, then is the thing Here's the thing, uh, and I think this is the thing with Dr. Hugh Len, which I always share because it's a tangible thing, and you've heard me share it again and again. But you know, Dr. Hugh Len, prison full of violent criminals, uh, he didn't actually go and speak to them and sort of give them therapy and tell them, look, you know, just give up the axe murdering, it's not so good for you, and you'll be in prison less often. <laughs> um, didn't ha have to do that. All he got was he got the files, you know, this is an axe murderer, this person likes to run over people with cars, so whatever it is. And he got their files and all their history, their crime history, and he just, what, I, I'm going to use my interpreter, to transcend the data, you know, did the forgiveness work, really came, you know, I'd say he's coming from a place of oneness, like there is, an, there is a connection between all souls, or beyond the connection to all souls, there's a oneness. So if I clear... If I'm at a very high level of consciousness and I clear the data in me that this person is wrong or bad or in pain or whatever it is, um, then I have released something from the collective karma of this world. I don't know if that makes sense. I've re released some co collective um, limiting <coughs> ideas that manifest this world with illusion and pain and suffering. So he just did that and he just cleared what he saw was wrong just from the prison files and everyone in that prison got well and they had to close down the prison because everyone got well. And that's without him going to the prison and saying, look, let me talk to you for an hour every week and try and give you a different way of looking at things. So the work was just purely spiritual without even interactions with the person. Also brings into question, you know, um, there's a thing, you know, if you start talking about Jesus and the miracles that perform, when you're at very, very high levels of consciousness, all kinds of miracles can happen, which would seem impossible when you're at lower vibrations. So, you know, for me, uh, and actually there was talk in the group earlier about the miracles of when you let go and surrender completely and come to peace around something earlier today. Um, and it's also been my experience as well with, um, uh, in my book, plug my book, Bulletproof Peace, um, you know, which is there on the table. <laughs> I don't want to go into too much marketing speech. But anyway, so, um, so I had this lady in a spiritual group, you've heard me share it before. She was a staunch uh, atheist and, I, and wanted me to stop using the word God, which meant a bit of a red flag to me that I kept using God more frequently. <laughs> but uh, but um, anyway, but I did all the forgiveness work, you know, the Course in Miracles work, the 12-step work. And then one day I woke up and I felt absolute peace in my heart towards her. There was no animosity, no nothing, you know, I just felt love for her. And that the day I went in there, she, I mean, we didn't speak to each other. We just, like, verbally shared in opposite sides of the room. So she actually came up to me on that day 
and said, Sabir, taught me a great spiritual lesson. I just want to let you know I'm leaving the country. And, and she left. And I knew that, that my, my sign, my lesson with her that the universe had given me, you know, I'd gone to complete forgiveness. I didn't have any animosity. There was nothing, just love for her. And on that day, the universe decided to take her out of my life and deposit her somewhere else in the world. You know, and that's what I've seen over in my own case and other people's situations. So it's this thing of, you know, more powerful than being, not, you don't have to be there for a person to help that person. You know, the, you know like, <clears throat> I do understand what it means, you know, this thing of like detaching. You know, you, want, you need to end your relationship for whatever reason. There can be many reasons. I think often it's good, you know, vibrations can be different, one has a different spiritual outlook, one is progressing, the other person isn't, one has different views, uh, it's time to leave. But, you know, you really want to cause that other person no pain. And, uh, but really, for me, the, the ultimate gift you can do is not necessarily always, you know, I don't think actually being with the person necessarily is always, the, isn't that important. I think letting a go person go, and if you really, really love them, and you want to give them extra, you just transcend everything within yourself. Every defect you think you've had, just transcend it. And what, I mean, I'll explain later what I mean by it. We have tools for transcendence in this group. Uh, Course in Miracles, Field of Feelings. Transcend, you know, oh, she, you know, she's a bit of a nutcase. She's always in drama. She's always like, you know, up, ups and downs, whatever it is. But you let, it, let that go and come to total peace. When you come to, when I say transcend something, what do I mean by that? It means when you've done the work, there's different ways of transcending things, cancelling beliefs, uh, putting things into God's infinite light and love, going to the observer. <clears throat> it's like anything that comes back into your head over and over again, which is obsessional, means that it has meaning attached to it. It has value attached to it. It's important to, the, to your sense of limited ego self. Your ego finds that meaningful. Oh, I'm going to miss the jokes you used to tell. I'm going to miss... Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to miss, you know, her smile or whatever it is. But actually, for me, that, those are things that come back into my mind over and over again and block the now. They block being in a state of infinite peace and love. And actually, if I'm holding on to data from her, here's the thing. If I'm holding on to data from her, which my ego would call special data, oh, I don't want to forget my memories of her. Actually, for me, actually... If I really, really want to help her, I want to clear everything that I have of her. Because I'll be clearing in that field of universal oneness her stuff for her. You know, it sounds funny, but if I talk, talk about Dr. Hu Len, you'll get it. So it's like, okay, you know, it might, she might be upset. Look, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I have to end this relationship. You know, I wish you all the best. And then, you know, you let, you let it go. Um, you say, uh, and, uh, and you don't get back in contact. You know, with her again, but you, but you love her, so you just do. You know, if you've got feelings that are coming up, you feel sad, you miss her. Just sit with those feelings and release it until there's no feeling of loss or, or abandonment or grief or whatever it is. Feel them out. If you've got special thoughts, I, I miss the way she smiles and says hello in the morning, whatever it is. You know, then just keep going to the observer. Keep cancelling your belief. You know. Now, this sounds pretty, pretty odd, you know, but I've cancelled my belief that she has a great smile. I'm an infinite being, subject only to what I hold. I cancel my belief that, uh, you know, I'm going to miss her jokes, or that she was the funniest person I'll ever meet, or something. You know, the ego gets funny sometimes. So I cancel my belief she's the funniest person in the world, never meet another person again who's funny. I'm an infinite being, because that's, that's like pulling you into an ego personal relationships, like it's not opening up to the abundance and the infinite nature of God if you completely wipe the data so that you can be in the now. And that for me is like, you know, it sounds like it's, it's counterintuitive that you're actually helping her more by letting her go. Because as your power increases and that karma that brought you together and you transcend that karma and your consciousness elevates, you'll now be open to another opportunity from the universe at a higher level of consciousness. And also, it will be the biggest grace you can give her is to clear your wounds and your associations and your wanting to go back, you know, with this special data, this meaningful data, or wanting to carry on. I'm going to, ca I'm going to cry for you forever and never stop crying, or whatever it is. 
or I'll never forget my memories of you. I think, you know, for me, what is it? It's, I'm not trying to sound cold, but when you get into the infinite now, the eternal now, those states of bliss and flow, you know, one becomes an instrument of the divine. Everything is given in the now if you need it. And if you don't need it, you don't need it. You know, let God be the orchestrator of what's needed in the now. But you holding on to data on a personal level so that it comes back over and over again because you want to hold on to it at a personal level. You know, I, when I remember, for me, that is actually doing her less good. Um, <clears throat> so that's the one thing. I actually think, you know, letting someone go uh, and not, you know, the thing of, after you've let someone go, because a lot of people, especially in deep, in me, I'd say the word enmeshed or very intense relationships, you know, sometimes ca calling them back is not good for them. You know, it sounds cruel. You know, but, you know, they, if you let, let them go, they may go into grief, they may get upset, but that's natural. But then you calling them up every week and saying, how are you doing? Uh, do you want to get back together for uh, just a quick catch up? You know, it stalls their grief process and letting go and finding something else. So if you give them a clean break and just let them go, and then if they go, oh, I'm missing you after two months, do you want to get back together again? Sometimes not answering or letting them go, or just giving them polite, look, you know, it's time to move on. Uh, and then they can grieve completely and get go into their next uh, next relationship. There is an attack, you know, when you get special, you know, of course we call it special relationships. For me, I'm all about dissolving all special relationships. To get to the whole, you know, the, of course we call it the holy instant. What's my interpretation of the holy instant? It means there's holiness in every instant. It means there's no specialness in any instant. All special relationships are dissol dissolved, and then you're in the holy instant in every instant. How can you get out of the holy instant? If there's a special relationship in the next instant, then you're not in the holy instant, you're in a special relationship in the next instant. Or if in the, if in the holy instant you remember another relationship because it's special, then you're not in the holy instant, because you've just remembered a special relationship. So special and holy don't coexist together. So you're either in the holy instant, in which case there's no identification with your limited sense of self making another relationship special, or you're in the holy instant when the idea of you being special and another person being special is dissolved, and then you're in the, those flow states, those infinite states, those states of limitless unfolding of the universe, where there's complete trust and there's not a need for a personal self to be holding on to limited data. So here's the thing that I was saying, because otherwise it would sound cold, but for me, that is the biggest blessing. You know, the saints, the enlightened teachers, because they don't hold on to personal data, because they don't hold on to special data, they don't make their limited self is not special. Other people are not special. They emit unconditional love. They emit universal love. They emit holy love. And it's not from a person. It's the absence of a special person to a relationship with a special person with a special person. That is the biggest gift. That presence, which is the absence of limitation, is the biggest gift. And you know, like, if, you, if you're around an enlightened teacher, like, every person feels enormous love around them. But they don't, they don't have, like, special love for you. That's the paradox. Even though the love you get from them is incredible. But that's because they have infinite love for everyone, and they don't make anyone special. So it's like a paradox. So the more you have, the less you have special relationships, the more you are a gift to the world. So that's the thing. For me, it's always about, you know, I, I've shared, I won't go into it because there's lots of other videos on it. Like my mother, I wanted to make her completely non-special. You know, which sounds very, very, you know, it would sound like you, you want to make your mother unspecial. <laughs> doesn't sound very nice, does it? But my relationship transformed from something being very difficult with my mother when I expected her to behave a certain way, talk in a certain way, not, and not to do things. And when I released all of that stuff, she can say what she wants, do what she wants, have any vocal expressions, facial expressions, anything, and it won't affect me because I transcend everything. <clears throat> Funny enough, when I got to that and she wasn't special, the relationship became a relationship of love. You know, it's a paradox. So that's the, that's the blessing, you know. Um, you know, the ego might go like, you know, you probably, if you, you know, I sometimes think if you let someone completely go and had a romantic relationship, you probably bump into them five years later and they'll say, 
since I left you, my life's become amazing. You know, I've got the person of my dreams. It's like I had so many miracles synchronicism. And it was the day I left you. <laughs> and then what they won't know was that you fully did like hours and hours of like spiritual work on, on letting them go. And then they got that love, you see, by you know, like, like Dr. Hugh Len wasn't visiting these violent criminals. He was just spending hours transcending the data. Okay, you're an axe murder, you're a thing. And then they suddenly all got well and left. So their life's blossomed, and he, didn't, he doesn't take the credit. So that's the funny thing about being a miracle worker. You do all the spiritual work, other people get happy, they don't know why they get happy, and you take no credit for it, but that's what being a, a miracle worker is. Um, you know, I've, I've shared about love addiction, codependency. You know, getting enmeshed with people um, and, um, and having a special relationship with them um, for me, is uh, is not the biggest gift you can give a person. Um, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I mean, there's different levels of consciousness. But the more a person is closer to unconditional love, that is a bigger gift. You know, like everyone knows, like the more you make a person, the more you're in a special relationship, the more you become controlling. Because in the honeymoon period, you know, it's like they don't put their socks in the washing machine and you're on the honeymoon period and they're still lovely, you know. But the honeymoon period wears off, you know. The honeymoon period wears off. And then suddenly the socks not going in the washing machine drives you nuts, you know. And then you have to, like, control them, you know. And don't do that one more time or a leaf or something like that. So that's because, is, you know, the thing with special relationships, if you, if you believe in the idea of a, a special relationship, then that belief, I'll just explain what Ramana said, Ramana Maharishi, the famous teacher of enlightenment. If you want something, if you make something special, then really, and if you haven't got it, you're in a state of distress. You might not think it. Like, you, you know, if you make donuts special, or if you make that girl special, or whatever it is, then you're not really at peace now until you think you've got the thing you want. So you're going, oh, I can't wait to eat the donut and meet the girl, whatever it is. And then when you meet the girl that you want to meet, then you go into a high. Because secretly you haven't got it and you want it. So when you get it, you suddenly like, oh, I'm meeting the donuts, I feel really happy. Or I'm meeting the girl, I'm really happy. And that happiness doesn't come from the donut, or it doesn't come from the girl. The girl is not making you happy. The donut is not making you happy. But it's the absence of that thought of wanting. The absence of the thought of wanting it suddenly goes into silence and you get connection to God. So you suddenly go into a state of bliss around the donut or around the girl. And then the ego, after, you, after that state of bliss, goes, look, donuts do make you happy, so you should have more donuts. <laughs> or it's like, that girl makes you really, really happy. Like, can we meet again tomorrow? You know, because you, now, the ego now associate is addicted to the state of happiness being associated with a donut, or the state of happiness being associated with that girl. So here's the misunderstanding. Like, if you get a high, if you want something, you get a high from it. You have the potential to become addicted to the, the ego illusory idea is that donuts are special, or that girl is special, and therefore the idea is, last time I ate a donut, I was happy. So if I want to be happy again, I need to eat another donut. Or with the girl. The last time I met that, that girl, I was happy. So if I want to be happy again, I just need to meet the girl again. Now eventually, that loop breaks down. As any addict knows, after you're eating donuts regularly for 10 years, the donuts stop working and you're not happy after, you know, while you're eating donuts. Or that girl that made you really um, put you on into ecstasy when you met her and sparks were flying. After 10 years, she drives you nuts, you know. So. It, so nothing outside of you has the power to make you happy. This is the thing with the Course, the Holy Instant. So it's only the ego that projects happiness comes from food or happiness comes from the girl. So it's the Holy, it's the holy Instant. So for me, in, in pursuing enlightenment work or Course of Miracles work, it's like that, you know, being in the, being in the Holy Instant or being in the eternal now or being in the timeless now, that, that brings happiness. As soon as I start 
putting ideas of what gives happiness in the now. I'm losing the now. I'm losing the holy instant. I'm losing enlightenment because I want to make it about something, an object being special. Oh, I'm happy now because I've just eaten a donut. I'm happy now because this girl is in the room. As soon as you're on there, then you're going to have what I call roller coaster emotions eventually. You know, it's like, are there donuts being served today? And if there's no donuts, you feel disappointed. You know, or is that girl going to be here today? And, and you're looking forward to it, and then she's not there. And now you're not happy and, and you're feeling miserable because the girl's not here or there's no donuts being served today. So, like, donuts are the same as a girl, you see. It's like, it's like you trade specialness for being in the holy instant. And it's also a thing of, you know, not trusting the universe. You know, I, you could say, one of the things, you know, I chat, you know, it's like, um, we're in various different fellowships, but it's like, it's a limited idea that something is so special that it's the only thing that can make you happy. And the universe, yep. The question that I'd want to put into it, though, what if it's the other way around and you know that that person is turned, you are the donut to that person. They're making you special. They're making you the oh. object of their happiness and relying on you for that. And yeah. they're attached to you. Mm. But you're actually quite detached. You're just feeling their... Um, Yes, that, that is a great question. I do Feeling know. their addiction. Yeah. I had someone recently, um, uh, they're not in, the, in this room today, talk about someone who was suicidally dependent on them. Uh, and they were worried that if they let this person go, they would commit suicide. You know, uh, from the places I visit, that's not unusual. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I go to 12 step fellowships where, yeah. where people can be. They can be addicted no to donuts, <laughs> they can be addicted to donuts, or they can be addicted to people, and they th they'll feel suicidal if they lost this person from their life and they'd want to jump off a bridge. They go, if this person left me, I'd jump off a bridge, you know, I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't want to live. So that's the level of dependency. If you're in 12-step fellowships, that's not unusual. My, my answer to them was, um, uh, and, you know, just take what you want, leave the rest. You know, for me, uh, I believe in uh, past lives and reincarnation. Uh, so in the, the absolute, when you're observing lives, uh, that enlightenment is beyond all lifetimes. But, or we can say that nothing happens in God's world by accident. But actually, for me, it's the thing of everything is perfect in every moment. Every person you meet is perfect in every moment. The universe, there are no accidents or mistakes. Um, also, the thing is, um, to be a saviour, you can't be personal in a relationship. You know, the, you know, if, you, if, if I really love someone, I have to let go of my personal attachment to them. That is if I really love them. If I don't really love them, then I'll hold on to it being a special personal relationship. Now, also, I see that, now here's the thing, uh, how I see it with uh, people who are suicidal. If I was out with a girl and she was suicidal, she said to me something like, well, if you leave me, I'll commit suicide. Uh, that's what's going to happen. Uh, you know, for me, it would be the thing of, well, everything is contextual, but for me, uh, the thing would be that um, if, if, you know, there's, there's, well, there's two ways to go. One is to see if I can transcend all attachment while being in the relationship and hopefully she'll leave because she'll get better. Or the other one is to leave and even if she commits suicide, that's okay. Because I don't see, I, this is me anyway, I don't see that this life is the only life. And you know, taking responsibility for someone else's karma, I don't see as being you know, when one, you know, one sort of sees like I'm responsible for someone else's, all of someone else's karma. You know, like if I met someone who was like, let's say I met someone who had an extreme eating disorder and was having heart palpitations and I went out on a date, I went out for dates with them for five dates and they said, every time you leave me I get heart palpitations and I think I'll die if you leave me. And so I'm now responsible that if I leave them and they commit suicide by eating another donut and having a heart attack, that I'm responsible for that, you know, and I should hold the guilt for that. When they, I would say, more realistically, they were already 
99.99% recurring suicidal when I met them. And they're probably, you know, and now they're saying to me, if you leave me, you'll commit suicide. And then I should take full responsibility. Oh, they, I've left them. That was my fault they committed suicide. I mean, it's more like I sort of see them, like, we say in 12-step uh, meetings, like, people need their rock bottom. I don't want to deprive people of their rock bottom. Like, if you need to eat more donuts, we're saying a 12-step meeting for food, if you need to eat more donuts and do more research on donut eating, just go, go out and have some more donuts. And when you're ready to work a spiritual program, come back to me. I'm not going to try and walk around with you all of London stopping you eating donuts for the rest of your life. Like, you go ahead, eat those donuts. <laughs> donut <know>. police. <laughs> and <laughs> if you're going to have a heart attack, I'm not going to take responsibility for you going out and live my whole life making stopping eating donuts. Like, go eat the donuts, and when you're ready to do some spiritual work, and then the next day I read in the newspaper she's dead of donuts. You know, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to take personal responsibility that she was already 99.9% .9 and her, me taking the guilt of her dying of a donut overdose the next day is like, okay, you, you have died of a donut overdose. You've got to come back for another lifetime in this world and have to face your donut addiction. I'm not taking responsibility and be responsible for your donut addiction. You come back next lifetime and then choose to get well when you get another opportunity in your next lifetime. That's how I sort of see it. So, you know, now from a limited context, it might sound cruel. You know, like your friends will say, well, you know, she loved you so much and you left her and you're, you're to blame. But no, I'm not to blame. And maybe I'm doing you a favor. Either get into more pain and choose to get well or don't, and die, and come back again, and the universe will deal with you. Sorry if that sounded a bit cruel, but uh, it's like, you know, overtaking responsibility for people who are already in a negative place, and then feeling guilty about it. And actually, the other reverse thing is they may need more pain before they hit bottom and choose. I don't have to be... But also, on another level, if I really love them, I'll do the work, I don't have to be with them. Oh. Yep.